we are Yay. live. <laughs> yes, we are. We are we live. Always, we're always live. We are always yeah. live. I am alive. I am live live. All the different manifestations of it. So we are live. And this is Rap, a live show in the storefront window of the DKNY shop at 420 West Broadway. My name is Emily Baltz. I'm your host for eight weeks from September 8th till October 27th broadcasting interviews with incredible female artists, designers, and creatives talking about their recipes for art and process. That is what RAP stands for, Women, Recipes, Art, and Process. And today I have the great privilege of sitting next to one of the most inspiring women in New York City, I think, if not the world. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the great Paola Antonelli. Paola Antonelli is a senior curator at the Museum of Modern Art in the Department of Architecture and Design, as well as MoMA's founding director of research and development. She has curated numerous shows, lectured worldwide, and continues to serve on international architecture and design juries. Her work investigates design's influence on everyday experience, often including overlooked objects and practices, and combining design, architecture, art, science, and technology. Additionally, she has taught at the University of California, Los Angeles, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and the MFA programs of the School of Visual Arts in New York. Antonelli is the author of many books, including the exhibition catalogs for Design in the Elastic Mind from 2008, Talk to Me, Design in the Communication Between People and Objects, and Design in Violence. She is currently working on the exhibition items Is Fashion Modern, which opens in October 2017 at MoMA. Welcome, Paula. Thank you, Emily. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So this last exhibition is actually very topical. We're sitting in the storefront window of a fashion shop. And I'm curious, have you answered this question yet? Is fashion no, modern? No, not yet. <laughs> and it's, it's really great because I have not specialized in fashion. I mean, I did architecture. Oh, interesting. We're having an Theft. Arm. Yeah, no, not, not theft. Somebody's coming in wearing, like, as we say in Italy, lead underwear. <laughs> that is one That's way for fashion to be modern. Yeah, so I haven't really studied fashion, but of course I love fashion. And I studied architecture and design, and fashion is a form of design. So I am appro approaching fashion as a form of design, so with the kind of mind frame that I've always had. And in the process, I'm having a ball because... As with all shows, it's a pretext to invade a completely different world and learn anew. So the question, you know, the, the exhibition is entitled Items because from this design viewpoint, the approach to fashion is by looking at things, you know, at the items themselves. So the idea is to look at the 111 or 101, we have to see where we end up when we finish the checklist, items of clothing that had a really strong impact on the 20th and 21st century. So we're looking at objects that range from the little black dress to the kefir, or that range from the sari to the Havayanas. So it really is about zeroing in on the, on the objects and then understanding whether um, fashion as a system is in step with its own times. I mean, I think I know the answer, but it's always better to start an exhibition with a question because then people can also fill in the dots, you know, so you always yeah. involve the audience more. Is this what it means to be modern, to be in step with your own time? How do you define it? You know, the definitions come in, in so many different flavors. There's one definition that a, a, a former chief curator of painting and sculpture at MoMA, Kirk Barnado, once gave me, which is a beautiful definition. It's not his. He was quoting somebody else, and unfortunately he died, so I cannot, I cannot find it anymore because it is, but it's beautiful. The definition is that modern is everything that does not hide the process of its making, which is perfect for designers, right? So there's a certain, the idea is so strong that it shines through, and there's a certain transparency in the object itself that shows the soul and the idea of the designer. So that's what works for me. Um, another definition that works well is this idea of belonging, of being in your time. Yes, being in your present. Yeah, relevant and responding in some way. And pushing a little bit towards the future. Yeah. So projected forward. So you were just talking about it and saying that design offers you I'm going to paraphrase, but permission to look at a, a new category in industry in a different way. What 
Tell me about that. What does design offer as a lens when we start to apply it to different areas of life or of the marketplace? It's amazing because the, the, the adage that you've heard so many times that everything is designed is real. So you can literally pick every, anything and just have a ball. Like just this morning, no, yesterday night, I was looking at the video that talks about the release that Google did yesterday of a new open source font. I don't know if you heard about it, but it's called Noto, which means no tofu, because many years ago, when we used to have characters in computers at the beginning, when there was a translation between one set of characters and the other, and there was the computer did not recognize it, it would give you, remember those squares? The little yeah. squares yeah. that yeah, those were called tofu in parlance, <laughs> in like programmers' parlance. Oh, very so, appropriate. <laughs> so this this new font is called no tofu, and then it's shortened into noto because it's an attempt to be able to have a typeface that works for eight hundred language no eight hundred sets of characters, wow. and I don't know how many languages. So. I started watching this video and it's just amazing you know it's 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 a font and all of a sudden it's about Cherokee linguists it's about Tibetan monks and the calligraphy so this design this is one design object and it can entertain you with its making for you know at least a half hour if not longer so in the course of my career I have tackled of course what everyone thinks of as design cute chairs <laughs> and cars <laughs> But um, I've been able to also tackle fonts, of course, new designed in vitro organs, um, other scientific discoveries and uh, video games and you name it. You know, so every time you look around, you can pick a new entry into the world of design. You know, one of the, well, the topic of this series is women and how we define what it means to be a female in the world, how we act as it. Looking forward, I mean, we're seeing so much work in bio design, mm -hmm. and also I think that has ethical considerations, questions around this. Can, can we design female? And if so, what would that mean? Or if not, what would that mean? You know, it's interesting because um, I've been thinking about it a lot lately, also because of what's going on. Hello, guys. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Ciao. He likes it. <laughs> yeah. I've been thinking about it a lot, also because of what's going on in politics, right? Yeah. And uh, I've been thinking about the different considerations that, uh, and I've been thinking of misogyny, I've been thinking of the advantages and the cliches. And I usually kind of refused the idea of talking about women designers and there was an exhibition actually it's still going on at the Triennale of Milan which is about women designers that I refused to be part of and then I saw that my, my stuff is there still um, but I go back and forth you know at, at some point I was completely against and now I'm thinking maybe instead it should be important to make it happen. All I can tell you is that every time people ask me, and it happens very often, for like 10 names of architects or designers for a job, they don't even notice, but eight are women, and I don't even say anything, it just happens to be so. Um, I do not believe that there is a female and a male way to design, even because talking in binaries is so moot at this point. There are so many in-betweens. But definitely, there's a different general attitude towards design. You know, in a way, architecture is more of a masculine uh, pursuit than design because architecture requires an egomaniacal stance that often women do not have. So if I have to, to use a cliche, it might be that. But when it comes to design, I don't think that there is a female and a male way to design. There is a good or a bad way to design. <laughs> It also, I mean, you've continued to push the boundaries of what design means, of moving it beyond just formal objects. And I remember in Design and Violence that there is a quote that is something about that you're also exploring the, the smelliness. Mm -hmm. And to me, that says very clearly design is not an object, right? Mm -hmm. But can design also be a feeling, an emotion? 
Definitely. By the way, I have to say something I'm super proud of. Yeah. Design and Violence opens in Dublin. I saw this. On Friday. How I'm going to cool. be there. I know, exactly, Woo! right? Yeah. yeah. Post digital. Anyway. Really great. Um, yeah, Design and Violence was a whole project. I'm going to say for the audience, it was not an exhibition. It was an online project. It was supposed to be an exhibition, but it was rejected as a show. So it went online. It was a WordPress site. And every week we would publish a different that had an ambiguous relationship with violence and we would have somebody comment, somebody authoritative and expert uh, comment on it. And the, the first object that we used was a scent. And it was the scent of violence. It was uh, distilled by Cecil Tolas, who's a really great scent artist and, uh, uh, and scholar. She had gone to all these cage fights, that was masculine. She had picked up all the towels left by the fighters. And then she had, using these technologies that are used in the perfume industry, she had captured the scent that was left on these towels. And it was a fetid scent that we sent to Anne-Marie Slaughter, you know, the journalist and um, scholar, expert, of course, in foreign affairs, but also in female affairs. And uh, she smelled it, almost passed out like I did when she smelled it, and then wrote a beautiful piece. And the question at the end um, was, is violence male? Because we would ask a question every week after, after explaining this object. So in that particular case, I don't even remember the, what the question was that I started with. <laughs> Can design but, move beyond objects? Can oh, we do yeah, yeah. emotions? Yeah. yeah, so as far as I'm concerned, I think that scent is a form of design. So it really is designed to obtain, to, uh, uh, to kind of stimulate a particular reaction. And uh, it is really powerful. It creates, it designs space around it. It designs behavior. So it's completely a form of design. So much so that there are institutions and companies and airlines and hotels that patent their own scent. I travel a lot and I usually travel on one particular airline that has a scent that is, it's not bad, but I would like to kill them because they really <laughs> hammer you with that scent. You know, it's so strong, you immediately recognize the mm -mm airline. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and thus you bring your own spray bottles around with you. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that this question comes up for you all the time, and I, I want to ask it also for the sake of this interview, but we're in these times more than ever where I think boundaries are blurring. We have so much. You've even talked about hybridity in terms of defining new spaces as things coming together. Design and art. When you talk about scent, when I hear all those words, I think, oh, but doesn't a painting do this as well? Doesn't a sculpture do this as well? Sometimes, but you know, when, when um, I used to teach at UCLA many years ago and I was teaching a class that was called The Nature of Design, it was open to the whole campus, and one of the questions that the students asked me, not only design students, but geology students, political science students, they would ask me, what's the difference between design and art? And I would always tell them, the let's talk about people, let's not talk about fields because that's too vague, but I said the only difference between an artist and a designer is that an artist can choose whether to work and be responsible towards other people or not. And a designer instead has to be by definition. That's it. So um, yeah, painting can do that, but we don't know if the artist wanted that to happen. Maybe a painting does that because it's been hailed for decades by art historians as the most important one. Maybe it does that because it's so rare. But uh, designers work from the very beginning with that idea that they're working for someone else. Yeah. Sometimes a client, other times it's people in general. Yeah. Now that relationship, when you look forward in the world right now, obviously beyond the fashion, uh, what do you think is our responsibility in terms of being responsible to other people or responding to the world in that way? as creatives and as designers. It's huge. Yeah. Um, not only as creators and as designers, but as human beings and as citizens. Our um, agency and our power as designers is that we can initiate behaviors. And everybody can initiate behaviors. I am uh, I'm forever um, in awe of the anti-smoking campaign that also worked on me because I also quit smoking. And it was just not even peer pressure. It was pressure, it was human pressure, it just made it difficult and inconvenient 
what was once a pleasure, right? So it really worked, and we can do the same by um, you know making sure that there's places where you can sell, where you can throw away your recyclables, you know. So it really is a power that we have of designing the world around us to inspire certain behaviors, and then children will do the rest because you know children also create a lot of good habits and good behaviors that then percolate up to the parents. So it's um it's a chain reaction but um it starts with uh one person being responsible and kind of infecting others and uh, infection is what we can do as designers oh this is a beautiful definition <clears throat> let us all get inoculated i know that, that was <laughs> i know because i'm thinking of that because i need to go get vaccines <laughs> Let us vaccinate ourselves for yeah. future good. Now you are you are Italian in origin. Yeah, no, I'm still Latin. Yeah, not even origin. One hundred percent. So, do you think that there is? In, but you work in the context of America in general. Mm -hmm. Is there still a difference between a European design and an American design? Yeah, I think um, the geography of design has changed so much because you know once upon a time, design was connected to the factories where it was produced. So once upon a time, Italian design was usually furniture and it happened in certain parts. And then you had Viennese design and Austrian design and instead American design tended to be more about tools of manufacturing and some of the best emigres here invented the most important things that have, that have happened to the world, like the spark plug. So it was, uh, and, and in England it used to be much more connected to um, heavy factories. Then, you know, it changed when um, the means of production started to be separated from the Design Act. So at some point, manufacturing didn't happen in Italy anymore, but the assembling of the pieces and the distribution happened in Italy, so it was still Italian design. Then even that is gone, right? So right now, I noticed that there's a sort of um, interplay between material culture, so places still have their own nature, and schools. So it's interestingly, I think that the geography of design today is dictated by schools, not anymore by nations or by manufacturing regions, but rather by uh, centers of culture. And that's why schools are tremendously important. So from this viewpoint, there's still a difference between European schools and American schools. Very often, Design schools in Europe, not always, but often are connected to an architectural school, sometimes to an engineering school. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen enough in the United States. They're too mm -hmm. often connected to art schools. And I say, I say it in an almost negative way because I feel that when designers think they're artists, they're gonna have a really tough, rough landing. Instead, if you think you're an engineer and then you discover you can be an artist, it's much better. Oh, this yeah. Is, yeah. <laughs> is it that the design, is it the individual will have a hard time or that the marketplace will not welcome them? That's what I'm, because you can go oh, in, yeah. I think, with one perspective of I am an artist and try to get a design job, right? Yeah, you know, but as I hear myself, I think I have to revise a little bit, but not too much. See, if somebody came to me for a design job and told me that uh, she or he's an artist, I would say, Bye. Because right. you know what? Yeah. Once again, it's your stance towards the job that makes you a designer or an artist. If you think that you're an artist, you probably will not have, not the discipline, you will have a different kind of discipline. Yeah. Right? So, but you're not, I mean, this is not the job for you. Go be an artist. Yeah. I mean, you lived this yourself. You're originally trained as an architect, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How, what was this path for you to now become a curator of design? It was very natural because I studied architecture in Italy. And in Italy, architectural school was a gigantic mess. We were 15,000 students, only in architecture, only in Milan. We paid $200 a year because it was mass, mass education. It was great, it was free education. But at that point, you were left to your own devices. So if you wanted to become an architect, you, you had to like kind of teach yourself mathematics and structural calculus and so on and so forth or find the right professors because you could get a degree in architecture without ever having <clears throat> even calculated a truss. Um, so it was really interesting because many people that went to architectural school would become fashion designers, graphic designers, would become not architects, not necessarily. Also in Italy, 
you don't really have strong journalism sh schools. You study whatever you study and then you write about it or you curate it. You know, so it was quite natural to do so in Italy. So I became a journalist of architecture and design and a curator. And then I came to the United States. MoMA is my first museum before I was doing freelance work. What, what a first job. It was pretty good. I found an ad in a magazine. Mm -mm. Wow. ID, ID magazine, yes. Mm -mm. Oh, this is incredible. Yeah. yeah, a classified section. Yes, please. Yes, pretty much. Has anything ever scared you in your work? All the time. Um, yeah. I just um, live my life in fear, pretty much. You know, like yeah. every time I have to do an interview and I have to push the button to go upstairs and do the interview, the pushing the button is something that I have to force myself. I'm terrified at even, you know, interacting with people at the store. I just, um, yeah, <laughs> everything scares me. Everything. <laughs> you wear it so well. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. Is this the philosophy of approach for your creativity? It's just the way it is. I cannot do otherwise. You know, if I let, if I let myself, if I gave in to the feeling, I would just be home all day long watching, you know, Battlestar Galactica is in Portland. Yeah. <laughs> I can really relate to that episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 100%. I understand. <laughs> I'm sitting in a storefront window. <laughs> Equally terrifying, but also great fun. Yeah, exactly. Now, one thing I'm curious about moving forward in, in the world, because what we're actually talking about is something that I think has gotten a lot of backlash in terms of the world of virtual reality, of being closed off from this, this precipice of accident, of real life, of engagement. How do you, what do you think about that as we move forward? I find virtual reality so far, almost everything I've seen, a little boring. Hmm. I am not afraid of the disconnect. I'm afraid for the disconnect when it's not worth it. <laughs> hmm. So I remember, you know, I re my favorite virtual reality are tools like cardboard, you know, things that you can actually keep in your hands that are almost like augmented reality so much so like the view master to me was the first augmented reality you couldn't really go around but it was amazing so the disconnect is something that we still have to work through because it can be a little dangerous being completely isolated for the world if you can fall or get yourself in trouble but I am not in principle against it I think that we just need to find a good use for it I really love augmented reality Mm. And uh, I would like, for instance, for the exhibition for items, I'm trying to think of how it can be used for the installation because every item has a past and a possible future. So I would like to be able to layer um, time zones, almost do a hall of mirrors using augmented reality. I hope that I'll be able to do it. Oh. But I'm never in principle against um, technological innovations. And I know that there are always people that think that social media are bad because they isolate people, they create more superficial relationships. I'm always like, you know, no, and not necessarily. It just depends on who has them in their hands. That's just different ways to live. Yeah, you know, I had Martha Cooper on, the mm -hmm. wonderful street art photographer, a couple of weeks ago, and she arrived an hour early so she could walk around the neighborhood to play Pokemon Go. Oh my God. And discover. <laughs> so in and of itself, it's the same behavior as she's always done of exploring the world yeah, around her. Exactly. Yeah. It's funny, Pokemon Go is, uh, was the one um, phenomenon that explained to everybody what augmented reality is. So ultimately it was so useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think my last question for you is a, is a future question and looking at technology, looking at the advent and the growth of design. What are things that you are interested in exploring in five years and ten years? It's hard to know what I will want to explore at that time. You know, ideas come so easy, you know, they're almost like a dollar a pound. It's the ones that you can actually make happen that really count. So I have a closet. In Italy there's another saying that, that it's like this <laughs> corny question they always ask in during interviews like, What's your dream in the drawer? And you're like, Oh, I want some <laughs> lead underwear I and have, dream in I, the drawer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have all these ideas that um, are just waiting to happen or maybe they will never happen. But I like to work um you know, I would like to work on uh, the idea of time. There's an exhibition that I proposed many years ago to MoMA that also didn't really go through, but one day it'll happen. It was called Timeless. Mm. The idea was to show um, the, 
this concept of modern, but show how it was in prehistory, like back in the Stone Age and today, and how it'll be in the future. So kind of put together diachronic, so across time examples, and show how we might be amazed by the fact that people that were living 2,500 years ago um, were as receptive as we are to innovation and possibly could work a complex computer just by intuition. Yeah, and maybe had already invented the better computer. Maybe so, exactly. Yeah, the Museum of Jurassic Technology. Yeah. True or not <laughs> true? Well, it, speaking of time, it is that time in our conversation mm. where I've made you a wrap. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. it's lunchtime, and Great. the show is called Wrap, so we continue the metaphor Ooh. all the way down the line. And I don't know, and I don't know if people know <laughs> that you are a food designer. I Ooh. am. <laughs> so this wrap here is oh, nice. a, it's a reconstruction, it's a reinterpretation of a wrap. I heard you love smoked salmon, cream cheese, oh, cucumber, thank dill, and you. capers. Yay. So this is created in the kitchen. And I don't need carbohydrates, so that's Ex- perfect. I, n- I intuited it. Yeah. <laughs> It's made in the kitchens of Once Upon a Tart down the street. And when I was thinking about it, I said, oh, we must reinterpret the idea of the wrap and the form of the wrap. So for anyone who's watching here, this is a, it's a wrap of cucumber. Mm -hmm. And that's another show that I proposed, you know, that food as a form of design. But say the ingredients. Yes, Yes, food. uh, Well, Mm -hmm. I have a lot more. It's a whole other conversation together. Smoked salmon, cream cheese, cucumber, dill, and capers. Some, I think, perfection. Antonelli faves. (laughs) uh, (laughs) Re-extruded in some way in the form of a cucumber. You're just missing Nutella and then you just hit them all. (laughs) (laughs) You you can make that experience. It would be so disgusting. I think I've made that before. Paola, thank you so much for this time together. Ciao. Ciao. And to everyone out there, ciao to you. We're back on Thursday at 1 p.m.